and bit. Um, okay, uh, next slide. So we're going to go over an agenda of, in the media, for the meeting in a moment. I just wanted to um, uh, make some acknowledgments. So this project is a project um, of the Gibson Land Trust in partnership with a set of partners, some of which are in the room that I'll introduce in a moment, uh, acknowledge in a moment. Um, uh, the city of Salinas uh, we partner with in many different ways. This particular project is not a city-sponsored project. It is a Pixar land trust and community project. However, um, the city is one of a number of very important partners. And so we wanted to thank the city of Salinas for working with us to secure this space for these four meetings. So this is the first of four meetings uh, there will be another one in September, one in October, and one in November, and they're all going to be here. So you don't have to try to find a new place, easy parking, everyone in Sherman Hall, it's a great facility. So thank you very much to the city for working with us on this. Um, also, I wanted to thank the city for loaning us the translation equipment. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, also we have a, a staff person with the city, Esther Cardenas, who's joined us this evening to help with child care. Um, and so uh, we also have several people from the city, Adam Garrett, Adam, I don't know where you are, um, and uh, Kristen Lundquist, who's in the back of the room, hand up, uh, who works for the parks uh, in the city, um, and they're part of our partners. Uh, um, I also, again, wanted to thank our uh, interpreter, Lupita, um, who works for an organization called uh, Translation by Design, and uh, they are donating uh, her services here this evening. Uh, so we deeply appreciate uh, Translation by Design donating your services. Thank you so much. Okay, um, there are several other people. Uh, everyone who works for the Big Sur Land Trust, please raise your hands. We have Jeanette Tutel over here, who's our president and CEO. Uh, A. Barbosa, right over there. Um, we have Todd Farrington in the back. Uh, Carla Ziliach in the back. Um, we have several staff members. Uh, helping with the registration desk. Please come find us if you have any questions during any part of the meeting. Um, we also have a number of partners. Uh, the Center for Community Advocacy uh, is here. Uh, many, many different people in the CCA. Uh, they're one of our key partners in helping um, uh, bring residents to the table, so to speak. Um, ensuring that resident voices are part of this process. Um, and we'll talk about our other partners as well in the few minutes. So with that, I'm going to hand it over um, to Mike Bellinger, with, who's with BFS Landscape Architects, who we have hired to help uh, in the development of some conceptual designs for this new project. Thank you, Rachel. I want to make a quick adjustment here in the audience. Clark and Ismail Gunn, 
uh, long-standing relationships with community members. And so we, uh, they um, graciously uh, agreed to work with us on this project, and there's a long list on this slide. I don't think you can read them uh, on your own. Uh, there are a number of people who work with these organizations in the room, um, and we are so um, very grateful to them uh, for continuing to show up and participate and lend their expertise and experience and knowledge um, on this project. Um, we are really seeking to listen to community voices, um, and we want to support those voices in helping shape uh, what this park will look like. Uh, and so the park will be um, designed based on those community voices and also what the land itself tells us is possible and feasible to do there. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we're interested in uh, developing a multi-benefit project um, that's based on the ecology of that site that um, helps increase uh, the opportunity for open space and parkland uh, where you and your family can spend time together in nature uh, and to use in different ways and we want to hear from you tonight what those uses might be in your view. Um, and look for opportunities to also improve uh, the water quality of the waters that run through Carter Lake and Mike's going to talk about that in a second, and also use the opportunity to perhaps help manage floodwaters or control flooding issues. Um, so thank you again for being here, and, and Mike's going to take the rest of the presentation and walk us through some of those areas for you to think about. Um, and I hope you all took the hand out. It's, I see a young woman here writing and taking notes. Uh, that's great. Um, and so you'll be able to take that home with you. We're also videotaping this presentation, and we will put it on our website in case you want to look at it again, or tell your neighbors uh, to have a look at it. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that these meetings, there are four of them, and they are sequential. One follows the other. So tonight we're doing a lot of talking at you, so I apologize for that. Um, but we're trying to share information a lot uh, tonight, and then we're going to have a lot of time for your ideas. Um, and then the next two meetings will be getting further and further into the design, uh, so in September and October, and then the last meeting in November, you'll be able to help choose kind of a preferred alternative. Um, so it's great if you have a a good enough time this evening uh, to come back to the next uh, set of meetings as they unfold. Okay, thank you very much. All right, take it away. So just notice that there's people on the side. Can you see okay? Okay. So Rachel's kind of giving you that overview, so I just want to explain a little bit about the process, the timeline that we're on. In 2016-2018, the land was purchased, and the Fixer Land Trust assembled their partners and began the process of looking at what the vision of the property might be. Today, we're right here, in the phase two, where we're starting the design. So this is an opportunity for us to get your input on the design. The other part of our team is scientists who are studying the water quality and the flooding aspects of the site. And we know we can't, we know we don't want to impact anybody else outside of our property, so it's important that we understand that science of, this, of the project. The next step. Next month, we'll bring the, the project designs back to you, and there'll be an opportunity for you to critique that design and explain what you're seeing and what you're not seeing, and we'll talk about how we'll get to the next step. 
Then later on, we're going to take your input and we're going to come back with, with one concept. There's several ways to, uh, many, many ways to design a park. Many, many ways to, do, to address flooding and water quality. We'll be sharing those as we move through it, but then we'll need to have one plan that we can move ahead with. Then later on in this fall, as Rachel pointed out, in October and November, all of the science will be uh, brought together with the design, and we'll have this plan, which we want to move ahead. And that's really still an opportunity for you to give comments on the design. So, as Rachel pointed out, if you could attend all of our meetings, that would be really great, because then there's some continuity between your ideas. So, Rachel mentioned a little bit of history. Uh, Jesse Carr was the original settler in this, on the property, and it began, he began with the farming. Shortly after that, the truths were uh, dug, and water was drained off the site. And through the late 1800s, and then in the early 1900s, the Ikeda family purchased the property and they've been there since that time of farming. Thanks. So, just wanted to explain a little bit about the other city plant. There, are, there is city planning going on around the site. So, this is the entire car lake. And this is the 73 acres that this, that Big Sur Land Trust has purchased. At the same time, there's a citywide parks master plan going on. There was an urban green study that happens to surround our lake. And then there's the Alisal Biodiversity Plan, which is looking for that, looking at that neighborhood. So we're not part of those city planning processes, but we want to recognize your input on those plans and other people's input as we develop the park. So here's Carling today. It's uh, it's a grand piece of farmland most of the year, and from this area you can kind of see it, the city just surrounds it. It's just an absolutely phenomenal opportunity for the park. One of the important things that we'll be talking about all the way through the process is the importance of recognizing the role of water and land in developing this, this park design. This is a, a giant watershed where all the water from this region, well up into the Gabalon Mountains, gets, comes down through a series of creeks and happens to come together on Car Lake. That's a, a very unique geography, geographical situation. Um, and so the importance of water for farming, for our uh, resident, for work for water at home, as well as for recreation, uh, has to be respected. And we want to find that way to value the water. So just wanted to recognize that Car Lake really isn't the lake. I mean, way back when, when we see it flooding, it kind of appears like a lake, but really, it is a series of creeks and, and uh, ditches that now uh, are drained out of the property and sent off to Monterey Bay. And some of the issues that we want to uh, recognize is that there's, today, there is multiple crops that come off the property and it does flood and we do see water continuously flood through these creeks. But the, the water problem that we're trying to address is, is the pollution that comes from the city. It comes from our rooftops, it comes from our streets, it comes from our backyards, it comes from chemicals and fertilizers in the city and from the farmland. And through these drainage ditches, the soil can erode and that becomes another, another issue. So, from a water quality perspective, we're going to want to see if we can actually uh, see how the water quality that 
currently which the can actually be mimic more about the upper one than the small leg on the Timidad Creek. So. so one of the things we, we wanted to point out, you probably already really well know, is that here's our site, but here's also the Constitution fields, the existing soccer uh, fields. There's another large proposed soccer complex across uh, Laurel. There's the Tibetan Creek Park. There's Cesar Chavez Park. Uh, here's the school that sits right at the edge of our site. And the sports complex, which is uh, run privately in with the city. So getting closer to our site, we saw the, we saw the whole big picture of our lake. But this is the property that Fixer Land Trust has purchased. You can see the creek coming down here. They come together right here, the other creek, the other creek. And these uh, are directed out towards, um, towards Monterey Bay through the wreckage. Uh, this whole area of the site is a flood zone. And, and you've everybody seen what it's like in winter. And that has been mapped and documented as an area that we, we really we really shouldn't be building on. In, in, most, in, in most instances, you really want to be above the 100-year flood plain. And that's this line right here. So there's about 10 acres of land above the flood plain that connects from Sherwood Drive back up this way and we were able to follow it through back up to Laurel. And then Constitution, Constitution, Constitution Fields. So what's important to understand is that this area will continue to flood and we have an opportunity of developing part on this. There will be some, some chances about coming out into this area, and we'll talk about how that will work later. Some of the first ideas that came from the community uh, from the first meeting was wanting to see nature, wanting to see a place for our, our families to get together, families and friends. Uh, people saw an opportunity for walking and running house, and they wanted a, a kid-friendly place, an opportunity for healthy exercise, and possibly some play fields. So that's that's kind of our starting point tonight. Do you mind if I ask Sure. Can we go back to that previous one? So I just want to make sure that people are oriented and know where we are. Um, so the entrance to, so this is Sherwood, here's the school complex, and the entrance uh, to our property is off of La Pensada Way. Um, and uh, as Mike, uh, so here's Sherwood, here's the school complex. So there's actually, uh, here's Las Vegas on the way, you turn off and turn into the property. There are a number of buildings here. Uh, there are some large agricultural sheds right here that used to store equipment. Um, there are two homes which we have rented out to uh, people who live here locally. Um, and there's an opportunity also to imagine uh, this evening and at the other meetings um, what types in general uh, uses there might be for these large storage buildings. What kind of, how that would serve community. And then uh, here's the 10 acres that Mike mentioned, which is a lot of land when you go out there and see it in person. It's a lot of space that's above the floodway. And then this area uh, is within the floodway. And it doesn't mean that nothing can happen there. It means that um, certain things, you don't want to build up or put concrete structures there. But you can do things like trails that you can run on and walk through. and ponds and uh, places for um, picnicking and strolling and those sorts of things. 
and we're going to uh, hear your ideas for that uh, this evening. Um, so there are different types of uses that can happen on the property um, for you uh, to consider, including the built environment here, this area, and then the rest of it. Currently, we have, we are um, leasing it to uh, a neighboring landowner um, uh, to farm. So there are farming activities going on there right now as they have gone on there for decades. Uh, and that will go on for several more years while we're doing all this planning work with everyone here. So, thanks. So as Rachel mentioned, um, it's not that we can't have access out into the flood zone and that there is opportunity, you know, in creating uh, ways for water movement, that we can have trails, we can have uh, boardwalks, we can, uh, people can walk and bike through. But we wanted to introduce, I want you tonight to tell us about the kinds of things you might want to see in your park in the neighborhood. This is just a couple examples of uh, parks that are right on the edge of flooding areas. You can see this one, there's a park that sits above the flood area, and they have pathways that connect down to it. This is an example of an area that does flood, and there's a raised boardwalk through there, so you could experience it even maybe during the flood zone. But it's a chance, there's a chance to have uh, paths on the ground and maybe raise boardwalks through it. So you have a chance even in the winter. The wildlife in the winter is going to be so much different than the wildlife in the summer. And so it's an opportunity to go out there and explore. So as I mentioned, on the flooded area, there's an opportunity. We're going to be looking at ways where we can change the channel, introduce different vegetation, different grasses that will help clean the water as it moves through the property. In the park itself, we have an opportunity to collect water that runs off the parking lot and clean it through these uh, grass ditches along in the park. Uh, there's also an opportunity for community gardens and replanting it with native plantings, uh, trying to create some interesting places for people, for kids really to come out and explore. It doesn't have to be uh, very trimmed. Everything has to be neat. It can be a really an opportunity to explore. So again, as what came out of the earliest meetings of the community was an opportunity to appreciate the beauty of nature, places to play, and places for friends and family. 